Thank you for being with us here on this special edition of I-20 for News. I'm Jeff Smith. I will be with you for the next several hours as we continue to give you updates on these developments here in Israel as we face the possibility of another full war with Hamas in Gaza in the hours to come. We have live team coverage, live reporters spread out across this country, so stay connected right here on this channel all day long. Here is what's happening right now as we speak. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, his Defense Minister, the rest of the Security Cabinet, they are continuing <clears throat> their emergency meeting at the IDF military headquarters in Tel Aviv. The meeting has been going on now for more than three hours. They're on a short recess, but then they will go back in the room, perhaps after their lunch break. They will keep the discussions going. They are deliberating right now on what to do next. A ground invasion of Gaza, further airstrikes, perhaps targeted assassinations of Hamas commanders, an idea that has been floated by other ministers in the past. We could know soon enough. Meanwhile, across Tel Aviv, community leaders, police officers, they're asking residents right now to be prepared for incoming rocket sirens. Tens of thousands of Tel Aviv residents are bracing for that possibility. Minutes ago, certain IDF reservists also were called up to active duty. For now, the call-up is rather limited. It's only for soldiers who work on the Iron Dome missile defense batteries, but that could change again and be expanded soon. Israel's south is on fire this morning. Overnight, Hamas launched close to 400 rockets towards Israel. Those rockets were deadly. They've killed people in Israel. They've caused many critical injuries. Israel's vaunted Iron Dome defense system intercepted about 100 of those rockets, but hundreds of others got through. It's the largest number of rockets fired ever from Gaza in a single day. These numbers will be changing. They are fluid. But right now, here's what we know. The Hamas rocket barrage killed one man in the city of Ashkelon after a rocket made a direct hit on an apartment building. Two other Israelis are critically hurt, and at least 90 other people are injured, ranging from cuts and bruises due to glass shards and debris, wounds also from running away, trying to escape, also anxiety attacks and shock. 11 Israelis right now are still in the hospital. Survivors from that Ashkelon attack are speaking out about their night of terror. I'm terrified. Me and, my, me and my daughter, we cried before. A lot of people cried out on the stairs, going downstairs. And uh, there's a lot of babies here. Everybody uh, was evacuated outside, must stay outside. I, I hope that everything's going to be okay. And right now we are following reports of another red alert, a rocket siren going off in the border communities right now near the Israel-Gaza border. I want to turn immediately now to our correspondent, Guy Israel, who is live in Ashkelon, again, that large, hard-hit coastal city just a few miles away from the Israel-Gaza border for an update. Guy. Yes, Jeff, it has been a dramatic day and particularly the night for this Gaza border communities here in Israel with one man killed just above me in this three stories um, building that we can see behind me. But to get all uh, the info about what is happening next, we have <coughs> IDF spokesperson, spokesperson with us, Jonathan Kordikos. Jonathan, what is the IDF doing right now to protect Israeli citizens from further rocket attacks? The rocket attacks that you refer to are indeed massive. What we have uh, faced over the last less than 24 hours is a barrage of almost 400 rockets fired from inside Gaza by the Hamas and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad towards Israeli civilians. And unfortunately, one ended up in this building. We've been able to intercept more than 100 using the Iron Dome, Iron Dome system, and the rest of the rockets fell in open terrain. The result here is, of course, very unfortunate, something that uh, should not and must not happen. Uh, and it is the result of a deliberate policy by terrorist organizations inside the Gaza Strip, who, by the way, are using their civilians as human shields. They're hiding their weapons behind and under their civilians, and then they're firing rockets at our civilians with a complete disregard for human life. Now, what the IDF is doing, we are deployed on the ground 
and I can divide it into a few different efforts. The first effort is on the ground, the Gaza Division, which is deployed along the border, the Gaza envelope. Their task is to defend Israeli communities uh, along the border and to make sure that Hamas and any other terrorist organization are not don't have the ability to cross into Israel and perpetrate any terrorist attacks on the ground, as well as, by the way, using uh, trying to use uh, tunnels. The second component will be the aerial component, the Iron Dome, uh, and other systems that we have that are tasked with defending against the rockets that are being fired. And the third one would be our offensive, our retaliatory uh, efforts that we are doing. Over the night or in the last 24 hours, we have struck more than 100 military targets, whereas Hamas and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad are firing at civilians, targeting civilians. We are targeting terrorists. We're doing so using excellent intelligence, and tonight we have struck, as I said, more than 100 targets. Four of those targets are what we call strategic large-scale <coughs> targets that really give a significant uh, impact on, uh, on the Hamas leadership. Jonathan, realistically, um, how do you expect this ongoing barrage of rockets to end when effectively we've been seeing um, th these sort of uh, things happening over the past eight years uh, with opera occasional operations every few years uh, and the idea of, of effectively is done nothing to stop it uh, uh, you know, for good. Um, these these are the, what these res residents are having to suffer every few years. Um, the, the residents here complain that they don't have enough protection. The IDF is striking in Gaza, but the Hamas doesn't seem deterred by that. I, I would uh, beg to differ, not with the, what the citizens here feel. I have nothing but respect for the people who live uh, in the communities around the Gaza Strip, in Ashkelon, in Netivot, who have sustained quite a lot of fire, unfortunately. So I have nothing but respect for them. Uh, and I hope that they will listen to the instructions of the Home Front Command, Pikud Aorif, and that they will stay close to shelters as they're ordered to. But let's set that aside. If you look at Hamas, their the current set of capabilities that they have and uh, their strategic situation, they're in a far worse position than they were four years ago and definitely seven years ago. And that isn't because we've been resting and lying about. That is because we have been attacking and denying Hamas these capabilities, whether it is their ability to effectively fire rockets. They continue to fire rockets, but their ability really to, uh, to hit is very limited. They continue to fire. We have now a proven system of finding and destroying terror tunnels. We did, they they uh, uh, used to have the ability to dig tunnels and to pop up uh, uh, to do so. So I think to sum it up, Hamas is not in a good situation. They're suffering. The results here is because of... Hamas is drawing the Gaza Strip into a desperate situation because of their situation. We will definitely see how the next few hours unfold. Jonathan, thank you very much. Jeff, thank you. back to you. All right, Guy Israel interviewing the IDF. Thank you so much for that update. Early this morning, as you heard, the IDF attacking more than 100 targets across Gaza. The Hamas-run health ministry says four Gazans were killed. Reportedly, they all were members of Hamas or the Islamic Jihad. One of the sites destroyed by the IDF was the Hamas TV-run station. The IDF fired warning shots, telling the people in that multi-story building they had to evacuate immediately. But then the TV station was destroyed. The IDF says the building was used to incite terror and that they were coordinating with terrorists and sending them messages out in the field. Airstrikes right now also continuing within the last hour. The IDF confirms a combat helicopter on the ground uh, fired, a fired on a group of Palestinians that was trying to breach the security fence and infiltrate into Israel. We don't know more than that about this particular incident. We don't know if those Gazans actually cross into Israel or not, how many casualties there are. But again, a short time ago, the IDF confirming a combat helicopter opening fire. We'll continue to follow those developments. More coverage, more live reporting analysis with our in-studio guests after a very short break. Stay with us right here on I-24 News on this special edition. We will keep you posted. We'll be right back.
What happened is that the people were sitting in their homes when the Israeli forces dropped warning missiles and missiles from drones. The residents were surprised and they noticed the Israeli forces were targeting the Al Amal Hotel. The Israeli forces dropped missiles with drones, then used F 18s. What about humanity and human rights? Where is the world and the Arab world to see what is happening in Gaza? Half of the residents in this area were unconscious from the smell, smoke and fire. All the walls and glass collapsed over our heads. This is what happened in the last missile from the F-16 destroyed everything. That is Palestinian reaction here on I-24 News, reacting to those Israeli counterattacks. Again, reports that four Gazans were killed, reportedly members all of Hamas or Islamic Jihad. But you hear there from Gazans saying that with these attacks, the IDF lacks basic humanity. Before the Hamas rocket attacks, yesterday afternoon it began actually with an anti-tank missile strike. Hamas launched a guided anti-tank missile at a bus. A 19-year-old IDF soldier was critically wounded. He's being treated at the hospital now. This is new video of the moment of impact. It actually comes from Hamas, from their media wing that released this video, complete with dramatic uh, music underneath. It is shocking stuff. You have to remember, the missile is meant to penetrate the thick protective steel armor of a tank. This is just a regular bus. Thankfully, no one died in the attack, but 30 seconds before, a group of 50 IDF soldiers got off of the bus if those 50 soldiers were still inside. Clearly, the situation would have been much worse, almost certainly deadly. Again, one teenage soldier seriously, critically hurt in that attack. Let's go live now to our Lauren Izo. She is on the Israel-Gaza border where IDF airstrikes are continuing this morning after uh, the airstrikes on more than 150 targets. Lauren, what kind of uh, damage are you seeing? What is the IDF doing behind you in Gaza right now? Well, Jeff, a lot has been going on today, so let me break down for you what we know so far. In the last hour or so, we heard reports that an IDF helicopter, as you said, was striking a group of Palestinians that were attempting to infiltrate the fence. Now, just before that, we heard that the Israeli Air Force was striking in Rafah, which is in the southeast of Gaza, and that follows earlier reports of the IDF striking between 150 to 170 targets within Gaza uh, that have to do with Hamas and Islamic Jihad, who are the ones responsible for launching the rockets, although Israel does blame Hamas for the latest escalation. Now, Hamas is saying if Israel continues to respond in this way, they will not hesitate to launch rockets into Israel as far as Beersheba or even Ashdod. All right. Uh, and also, we're hearing again, you mentioned it before, Lauren, these reports of the ongoing strikes. Are you seeing it around you? Are these reports that you're following? Can you hear them in the air? What kind of uh, are you seeing it with your senses in the border right now? Uh, it's a little hard to hear you. I think you're asking whether we're seeing um, Israeli Air Force planes around. We haven't actually seen any planes, but we've definitely been hearing the noises of those airstrikes from a distance because they're not because they're not happening super close to where we are. But we did just a short while ago uh, hear the rocket sirens coming from the community Nachal Oz, which is just a few kilometers south of us. Um, and so, you know, there's rockets being launched constantly, sirens going off in these communities all the time, and everybody has to be on constant alert. All right. Uh, Lauren Izo, again, hearing the IDF strikes, hearing the, the rocket alerts from where she is on the border. We'll be checking in with you shortly. Let me introduce our studio guests, Gonan Ben Yitzchak. Gonan is a former Shin Bet agent, Israeli security operative, as well as author. And also with me in studio, Ahmed Gonim. Ahmed is a member of Fatah, a former member, ex-minister of detainees with the Palestinian Authority. Both of you, thank you so much. I want to touch on these reports that we're following right now online. Palestinian media reporting that an Egyptian delegation is, in fact, in touch with members of Hamas and with Israel, that, that in the hours to come, Egypt will be on the ground trying to hold together this very fragile ceasefire deal that may be ripped apart could there? Do you think there will be international efforts today, or are we too far gone? Can Egypt actually make any difference at this point? 
Yes, Egypt is still working hard for the coming back for, to the normal situation between Israel and Gaza. Let's remember that uh, both sides, the Israeli side and the, uh, and Hamas itself, were working uh, for uh, de-escalation in the last uh, month, but they found themselves uh, uh, run out to uh, escalation. I believe that the international community have to uh, to carry their responsibility, not just to convince the Israeli government to come back from their aggression against the Palestinian people in Gaza, because Israel is responsible for this round of uh, escalation. They start the, the escalation uh, 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 night of uh, last Wednesday. Is it uh, the, the incident that you're talking about, the undercover operation deep inside Gaza yes, yes. that was exposed, led yes, to this gunfight, yes. is what we're seeing from Hamas, in your mind, is it a proportionate response? Is it a fair response? The launching of about 400 rockets or so. Sure, it's fair. There, there are no compare. There is no compare between what's happening in Gaza and what's happening in Israel. When you are uh, saying that's 400 rockets, uh, people think that's uh, all. Uh, half of Israel had been uh, destroyed or demolished. We are talking about uh, uh, rockets, which not having any compare with the Israeli machine. 80, uh, 80 uh, houses and buildings had been demolished in the last night in in, in Gaza, and uh, 14. Uh, Palestinians had been killed and uh, more than dozens of the Palestinians had been injured, while in Israel just one uh, one person had been uh, uh, killed and uh, um, nine, uh, uh, 90 persons had been injured by... Uh, 90 injuries at this no, point. It's not, they are right. not injured, they are real injured. It's, it's panic injured. It's not real injured. Well, there's there 11 in a hospital right it's now, four in the ER in the critical from, care. Okay, let's, let's, let me say that. It's, uh, many are in the hospital. They're still fighting for their lives, as let's we speak. Little peak white. Oh, okay, it's. Uh, let me say, um, it's a serious moment. The responsibility how to play positive role to convince both sides to come back to the normal situation and to convince the Israeli side they have to believe that there are no military solution for the issue of Palestine or or in Gaza. There, they must have political solution for this issue. Uh, the international community is responsible for that and the Prime Minister of Israel all the time is escaping from uh, from this issue and coming back to, to a round of violence and other round of violence. Uh, I want to turn to this this precipitating incident that you're alluding to that what's tipped off this escalating, ever escalating and now deadly round of violence was this uncovered IDF intelligence operation. Again, the IDF says it was an intelligence gathering mission that clearly was botched. Gonan, you worked for many years, of course, in the Shin Bet. You don't know details on this particular incident, but you know the general idea here. What are your thoughts on what happened? What went wrong? Was it worth the risk? With the ceasefire apparently in place, working for a day or two, was it worth this mission with the risk of exposure? I'll start saying that I have no information about yes. uh, the undercover uh, mission. I, I, don't know, I don't know what happened. I don't know what went, went wrong. But I think that when you think about uh, the fact that uh, uh, th there was an agreement, some kind of a ceasefire between Israel and, and Hamas just days before this uh, operation. And you think whether this operation was that critical to, to happen the same night when Prime Minister Netanyahu is abroad, when uh, uh, Miri Regev uh, is uh, holding the place of, of uh, Prime Minister while he's, he's gone, was it that necessary the same night to do it? I don't know. I, I must say I was surprised. I, I Even to now, I, I don't really understand why it was so uh, crucial to do it uh, well, the same so night. We don't know. I mean, we, know, we don't know. We, the IDF did release details after the fact. We know more about the, raid, the, the operation, the gunfight, the battle, to make sure the IDF soldiers were extracted. But the original purpose, we don't know. But that night, going in, right, you had IDF uh, retired generals going on Israeli TV trying to clarify, and they said this is rather routine. Not clearly this went wrong. It was botched and ended in gunfire and death. But the, I, we're there all the time. We have to be taking photographs and, and conducting intelligence, noticing who the up-and-comers are with Hamas. We have to do that. Is that wrong? At this point, is it worth, is it, worth it? Yeah, but, but sometimes you ask yourself, okay, I understand there is a routine. I know the routine. Yeah. But... Sometimes, when you find this uh, moment, when you, f you can uh, sign some kind of agreement, when 
Egypt is, is involved. When uh, you bring money in, into Gaza and you say, okay, let's see if things are working. If it's routine, if indeed it's routine, I guess Israel can wait a week, two weeks or a month to see what's going on and not take a risk. And now we need, you know, we need to uh, answer some, uh, some answers while we have uh, uh, retaliation in, in the area, while missiles are being uh, fired from Gaza to Israel, from uh, Israel to Gaza, when people are, are getting killed. Uh, now we, we need to ask ourselves, was this uh, worth it? I'm not sure. Uh, Ahmed, I want to turn to you. First, I, I want to... I have a comment. Can you imagine that such a group of Hamas uh, passing the boundaries of uh, to Israel from Gaza to Israel and killing three people, and they announce later uh, they, uh, um, uh, at the morning announcing that it's through uh, routine uh, things. We did the routine things. Sorry, it's uh, routine. It's this. Is, the acts had caused the escalation. But, Israel is responsible for, for that. Uh, so this original incident, and now we're two days past this point. You mentioned before that you believe that this is it's a reciprocal, it's proportional, but we have now 400 rockets. You know, we have 90 Israelis at least injured. They're not all, at least according to the hospitals, they're not panic attacks all or shock. You have 11 in the hospital, four in the emergency room, two critically hurt fighting for their lives, one ca killed and an IDF soldier killed. This is clearly deadly now on, on both sides. We have new warnings, new threats that the missile range will be expanded. If there's not a calm, it will be Ashdod, it will be Tel Aviv, it will be Beersheba under rocket attack. Do you think that is, you know, I know that you're watching now uh, as a member of Fatah, but do you think that is also reasonable? Do you think that escalating this further with more rockets into Tel Aviv, what would that mean? Look, um, if you have wise people on both sides, then think, uh, things will be changed. But um, do you think there's wise people on both are, sides? No, Can they, they are, bring it back? I believe that they, both of them uh, didn't want to go to open confrontation. Their strategy is just to test each other, and they want to uh, bring back, uh, back the, the, their uh, mutual ability to prevent each other from attacking the other. This is the uh, strategy of both, uh, Israel and Hamas. But I don't, I, I believe that that if the Egypt, uh, the, Egypt uh, the Egyptian will continue the uh, mediator uh, process today and uh, other parts of the international community are playing positive role, they will bring both, uh, um, uh, they will convince uh, uh, both the Israelis and, the, and Hamas to come down from the tree and to return back to the, uh, 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 maybe, to the uh, talks of the... Uh, More talks, perhaps condition. in terms of the ceasefire, which yes. apparently, and we should also point yes. out that for, about 40 hours ago, $15 million in cold, hard cash, U.S. currency, literally packed into suitcases, driven across the border. Electricity this month in Gaza, on average for a family, went from four hours to 12 hours. Things were starting to improve. The hope to get back to that point, tangible progress on the ground. But the security cabinet meeting going in is underway right now, stretching into three and a half hours. They're discussing all sorts of possible operations. I know you're not there. You're not, you're not a prophet, but what do you think, very quickly, is the most realistic outcome? We'll expand on it later, but in a minute here, what do you think happens in the hours to come? The Israeli government needs to find a way to uh, stop uh, violation uh, for many reasons, but I think mostly political reasons, because Netanyahu can't deal right now with his uh, 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 interrogation yes. uh, with the uh, police. Mm -hmm with some riots inside the, the Likud and the fact that when people are getting killed in Israel, so a way will there be, is a, a way will be found to tamper it down. All right, we're going out for a short break. We have more analysis, more live reporting coming up after a very short break. We continue to stay on top of this developing news, hear perspectives from around the region, all sides covered here. We'll be back after a short break. Don't go anywhere. The special edition will return in a minute. Welcome back here to the special edition of I-24 News as we continue to cover the escalating situation between Israel and Hamas in Gaza. The risk of another full-on war looms very large here in Israel today. Now, what happened overnight was historic. Never before in history have that amount of rockets, 400.
500 rockets been launched into Israel, even during the war four years ago. This has never happened before, but it's just the latest stage in a series of escalating events. In recent weeks, Hamas has launched rockets and mortars before, a steady escalation of attacks since August. In fact, here's a look back on recent history. And with me now is our diplomatic correspondent, Ellie Hochenberg, live for us outside of the IDF military headquarters in Tel Aviv, where the security cabinet meeting after a recess continues to stretch on now, uh, heading towards its fourth hour. Ellie, you've been covering this meeting and meetings like this for years. The length of this meeting now, perhaps, going into its about to go into its fourth hour, in your expertise, does it indicate anything to you? Are there that there's a lot of different opinions being discussed, that there's a division in the cabinet, perhaps, on the best way to proceed, or we just can't infer anything at this point? Whether it's an indication or we can read between the lines, the, the answer is uh, definitely no. Uh, the uh, Such meetings usually take a few <laughs> long hours, so uh, the length of this meeting is nothing out of uh, the ordinary. Indeed, it was a recess after about uh, three and a half hours. They're now they're back in the same room without phones, without advisors, just the security cabinet members and the top security uh, uh, brass uh, convening and uh, uh, after being updated and briefed on the actions that were made so far now with the decision-making uh, time. The RDF is illustrating all the potential uh, routes of actions, and the ministers will have to decide uh, what uh, what will be uh, the choice uh, indeed. Uh, there's definitely a variety of opinions within the security cabinet meeting. Uh, one of the main problems is also uh, leaks uh, uh, that are coming out of uh, such a meeting so far. The ministers were instructed not to interview, and they're uh, obeying uh, this instruction uh, again so uh, far. On the one side, we have Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who is saying uh, very honestly and uh, very clearly, I do not want to go to a full-on war. I have the political stability to avoid, or the political credit, rather, to uh, avoid the political uh, pressure and do what is right, what is responsible, and this is to avoid another full-on operation because, Jeff, it will bring us to the same point, uh, says Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, the same topics that are currently being discussed through the Egyptian and UN-brokered uh, uh, mediation uh, uh, efforts will be discussed in the aftermath of another uh, round of escalation while uh, during which our soldiers will be at risk our citizens will be at risk and this is what we need uh, to avoid on the other side uh, of the map uh, perhaps the defense minister victor lieberman who is supporting a more uh, hawkish uh, action uh, full-on uh, operation or at least a more determined or excessive uh, uh, operations on the ground the rest of the ministers are somewhere in between on this uh, spectrum but at the end of this uh, security cabinet uh, session, they will have to speak in one voice or at least to, to reach one clear-cut decision on how to move from this uh, point uh, onwards. Uh, we can expect that this meeting to last uh, for uh, a bit longer, Jeff, at this point. All right, the meeting dr uh, drags on, stretches on. Ellie Hochenberg live for us covering what she can outside of the security cabinet. And as soon as we get more answers about what went down, Ellie will bring it right to us. Thank you, Ellie. Now, back to Ashkelon, a home to about 150,000 and people are so a major port city, uh, not too far away from Gaza, about eight miles or so. It turned deadly under that barrage of rockets overnight. Here now is a child survivor of that attack who says that today he doesn't feel safe. My mother wants to move to Eilat only because we are five children in the family, as well as my mother, and we live on the fourth floor, and our home is not really protected. And... 
and every so often, if a rocket comes, we can be injured, and we don't really want this. So we're going to my grandmother's, who lives in Elat, and a man that the IDF will manage to beat them and restore everything to its place without missiles, without Qassam rockets. Here now is a soundbite as well from people inside of Gaza. Here's what the Palestinians are saying today. Hundreds of families are displaced. Where will we go to? I was displaced from Shajaya in 2014 war when my house was hit. I came and bought property in a safe place. Where is the safe place? Where is the safety? Where should we go to? Immigrate? We are not immigrating. All right, with me now in studio alongside Gonin is our senior defense correspondent, Jonathan Regev. Jonathan, let me start with you because there are limited call-ups right now of certain IDF reservists to active duty. Tell us who's being called up and perhaps what that signifies and what the next steps would be if there is going to be a wider operation. Mostly home front command. What does that mean? It means that Israel uh, perhaps fears that if there is some kind of escalation on, be on, on behalf of Israel, uh, stronger strikes on the Gaza Strip, uh, the Hamas in Gaza may react with uh, more rockets into Israel, uh, maybe towards uh, cities that have not uh, suffered in this round so far, such as Ashdod, such as uh, Beersheba, the, the big towns in the south of Israel. Uh, it is a limited, a limited call-up so far, not many people, but it indicates that Israel is perhaps preparing for a deeper escalation of this. This is on one side. On the other side, we also heard that uh, the, the same home front command is somewhat easing a few of the restrictions placed on the uh, citizens of those Gaza border communities. What does that mean? It means that we don't know what's, go what's going to happen. Yesterday, we were expecting to see what Hamas does following that incident in Gaza on Sunday night that we saw. Hamas was said, uh, basically, they put, they put forward their response loud and clear by, by uh, sending more than 400 rockets into Israel. Now it's time for Israel to decide how it reacts if it goes forward with, with uh, perhaps a stronger response, uh, which may also bring more rockets into Israel to other places or perhaps a restrained uh, uh, reaction. Yeah, we'll have those answers, of course, in the hours to come after the security cabinet wraps up. A very limited call-up of certain IDF reserves, reservists going in. I want to ask a question that certainly would be on the minds of many of our viewers. Just, just They know this is a big story. They know it's a big deal, but don't understand the details. Here's a question many of them may be asking themselves. Hamas is a terrorist organization. Yesterday they fired anti-tank missiles at a bus. They're launching hundreds of rockets. They're killing Israelis. Why not go in and take out Hamas? Why not wipe them out? I think uh, there is uh, operational uh, answer and political answer. And let's start with the political answer because politically, Israel doesn't want to wipe out, out uh, Hamas. Israel wants Hamas to stay in Gaza. They want Hamas to run the business in Gaza, but they want Hamas be weak. And of course, Israel doesn't want Hamas to launch uh, missiles and so on. And this is why Israel tried to find a solution to bring some money to Gaza, somehow to improve life in Gaza in order to, to get a weaker Hamas, but Hamas that you can still uh, uh, have some business on with. An uneasy alliance with. There's also that big question, right, going in of what happens next? What happens next? I'm putting you under the clock here in one minute. No one knows, right? We, we, know, we don't know. Uh, and unfortunately, somehow we are uh, waiting for Hamas uh, to answer this uh, question because the cabinet. They have all kinds of, of uh, things to do, retaliation, they can uh, start to uh, talk uh, with uh, Egypt. But in the end, if Hamas will decide to launch missiles towards Tel Aviv, towards other cities, this will change uh, the game. Yeah. And we are uh, now depending on Hamas. And we'll see what happens again. There are these fears that after the security cabinet that if there is going to be a widespread operation, if it's going to happen, that is when Hamas would, in fact, try to launch some rockets, get some damage into a big city like Tel Aviv. We'll wait and see. We're going out for a short break. You saw those live images there now in Gaza. For now, a quiet, calm, blue sky overhead. Will it stay that way? We'll continue our discussion and live reporting after a short break. So what does it sound like to be under rocket attack, to hear those deafening sirens, to be afraid for your life, for your family's life, to have to run to shelter?
sadly, hundreds of thousands of Israelis understand that fear all too well. This is what it sounded like early this morning, overnight, when hundreds of rockets rained down over Israeli skies, prompting those deafening sirens, thousands of families running with their little kids to bomb shelters where they spent the night. Let's go live now to our guy, Azrael. He's live for us in Ashkelon, a city that was very hard hit overnight. It had dozens of rockets land there, scoring direct hits on homes and apartment buildings, at least one person killed, many more injured. Guy, give us a sense of the devastation today in that city. Yes, Jeff, yeah, the most tragic event of uh, this night uh, actually uh, seemed less tragic uh, at the beginning. Uh, we're talking about uh, a siren that went off around midnight here in Ashkelon, the southern Israeli town. Uh, then uh, there was a direct hit of a rocket on this building behind me, this three-story building. Police forces arrived at the scene. They have found one a woman that was uh, moderately injured, and then they left the scene. But the extraordinary twist to that story comes um, just an hour later when a civilian that arrives at the scene climbs up to the third floor, and here's what he says and sees. My name is Shlomi Lankray. I deal with municipal refurbishment. I wasn't here when the rocket fell. I arrived an hour and a half afterwards and the police weren't here. I thought I'd go up and make a kind of video to show in case of war what the damage to the building was. While filming, I heard a kind of noise. I thought it was a bag. I was alone. I looked to the side and thought, maybe it's a bag, maybe it's something. I was alone. I said to myself, maybe it's from the window. I was curious, so I went to take hold of this. It was that dark, and I realized I was touching fingers. I dug with my hands, and the woman came out first. And as I was pulling her out, I noticed the man's hand. It was all one pile. The man was underneath it. I called the ambulance, told them to come, and they arrived. Well, just a horrific story there of his discovery of that body. Guy, Ashkelon, where you are, right? It's a big city, 150,000 people or so. It's on the coast, miles away from Gaza. When you're speaking with people, when you're speaking with survivors, what kind of mood do they have? What do they want to see, perhaps, even? What kind of solution are they hoping for in Ashkelon today? Jeff, uh, first of all, the, this particular neighborhood in Ashkelon, in southern Ashkelon, uh, has been the victim of most of these uh, rockets that uh, uh, were targeted from Gaza last night. And the people here are, first of all, they're angry. They're angry for the lack um, of uh, safety that they have here, with the fact uh, that they do not have enough shelters uh, to protect them during the night when these rockets uh, hit, when they hear the alarms. Uh, when we speak to them about the conflict, their anger goes mostly to the government. They say it is up to the government to find a solution, whether it is to go all in on Gaza, on Hamas, uh, and, and use a military force to stop what is happening, or use diplomatic forces. Uh, but either way, they, they say that they cannot tolerate this situation for much longer. All right, Guy Israel, live for us in Ashkelon. Thank you so much for your reporting. Back now with Studio. Your thoughts? Uh, this morning. What is going through your mind right now about the next step to stop these attacks? Well, well, hi, thank you for having me, first of all. But I've been living around the Gaza Strip for the past 16 years of my life. I've been living here with my family, uh, younger siblings, uh, my parents, and it is a terrifying place to be in because you really don't know if you're walking or if you're outside of your house, you're going to be safe. And you're constantly thinking about where's the closest shelter and how fast can I get there? Um, in terms of solving this, I really don't know how to because I'm not qualified. Most of the people who live here are not qualified to give that answer because we're not majoring in politics or in the, I don't know, um, Israel Palestine um, conflict because it's not something that we're aware of. But for now, I just, I don't, I don't like, honestly, I don't care how you solve it. 
please do, <laughs> because I would like to sleep more quietly. Ingmar, tell That's me, tell me if I, uh, if you could, just about yourself, about your family. How did you spend the night? I mean, were these rocket sirens going off, and did they wake you up, your family up? Did you have to rush outside to a bomb shelter? Tell me what your life is like on a day like this morning. This morning was tonight specifically in my area was pretty quiet. It was very. Um, crazy. We were all sleeping, sleeping um, downstairs uh, next to our shelter that we have inside of our house. The whole family was just sitting, uh, sleeping in the basement. Um, and earlier in this morning, we had uh, an alarm at Seva Dom. Um, we just got up, went to the bomb shelter, and went back to our rooms and kept sleeping in because it's just something that we're used to. Unfortunately, are you afraid, Imbar, that if there is a major operation, if in fact there could be a ground war, maybe a really big one that could do serious permanent damage to Hamas, maybe even topple Hamas, are you afraid of the unknown? That at least you know with Hamas what what they're doing, what the IDF is trying to do on the other side. Are you afraid of the unknown? What could happen next after the next war? Oh, obviously, of course. I mean, if you have a family here, you're constantly afraid of these things and because we don't really know what's happening we're kept in the dark about a lot of things the residents that live here we don't actually know what's going on it's terrifying because you think oh the things are going to get solved everything's going to be okay it's going to be for a couple of days and then we're going to move on with our lives because that's how it's been but if there's going to be a permanent solution to the whole hamas problem in the gaza strip i don't i don't know like i, I have no idea what would happen and that's terrifying because you don't know what retaliation would be you don't know how things are going to be solved uh, my brother is serving in the army right now i don't know if he's going to get called going into gaza or whatever i it's it's scary can i ask him bar especially for our international audience tuning in on a day like today explain what you know, your message about what it's like for you on the border why you live you're willing to face that risk so close to Gaza, what, what the draw is for you, and your message for our viewers who are understanding for the first time, perhaps, the fear you live in. Well, if you are listening in and you're in an international listener and you don't really know what's happening in Israel and all you hear are just big clickbaity headlines, you need to know that on both sides of this conflict, there are people. And there are people from the Israeli side that are terrified of going to work and terrified of going to school. And when they are outside of their homes, they constantly need to check where is the closest bomb shelter. And I haven't gone to school in a couple of days. Um, this is this is my college education we're talking about, and I, I can't go to school because it's in danger. And then the other side, it's a very similar situation, but from completely different angles. You know, people my age, you know, young people can't really go to school, can't really do anything because of specific people who are causing all of this problem. And, you know, just the regular people who live there who are in poverty and who are being held there against their will. Yeah. It's something that is just, you have to understand that it's more complicated than just someone did something bad. It has a long, complicated history. There are people being affected by this. And a solution, I wish there would be a very simple solution, but it's going to take a while. It's going to take a lot of time. It's going to take a lot of compromises that I don't think any side is willing to take. All right, Imbar, we'll leave it there. I want to thank you for your time. I hope that you and your family are able to find some respite, some calm and security in the days to come. Appreciate you being with us on the show. Good to have you. We're going out for a very short break. More analysis in studio. Jonathan Regev, our senior defense correspondent with me, as well as uh, Israeli security expert, former Shinbet agent and author, Gonya Ben Yitzchak. More analysis right here on I-24 News. All perspectives covered here on the show, live reporting from around the country. You won't get this kind of coverage, this in-depth analysis, up-to-the-minute updates anywhere else. Stay tuned as we leave you with the live images now on a quiet Gaza sky. Thanks for being with us here on this special edition of I-24 News. I'm Jeff Smith. I'm going to stay with you for the next several hours as we continue to provide you updates on the developments in Israel as we face the possibility of another war in Gaza with Hamas.
If you can hear now, my phone is going off. This is actually the red alert system. It's an application. The Israelis know it well. It alerts you when there is a rocket alert siren. I know it's not uh, normal to have your phone on with the volume on in the studio during a newscast, but we're keeping it on because we have to be aware of the rocket alerts. And there is one that is going off now. These are for Yad Mordechai. This is for the areas near the Israel-Gaza border. Another alert of incoming rocket attacks even now as we speak. We have here on this special edition live team coverage, live reporters spread out across the country. We ask you to stay connected right here all day long on I-24 News. Okay, let's get you caught up with what's happening right now. Israel's Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, his Defense Minister, the rest of the Security Cabinet, high-level ministers, they're continuing with their emergency meeting at the IDF military headquarters in Tel Aviv. The meeting now has been going on for four hours and counting. They are keeping the discussions going on what to do next. Could there be a ground invasion of Hamas, as some ministers want to see? Further airstrikes, perhaps targeted assassinations of Hamas commanders, an idea that has been floated in the past by other ministers we could know soon enough. Also happening right now, as you heard perhaps on my phone, the rocket alerts are still going off in uh, the south, and there is fears that they could happen as well in Tel Aviv. Police officers in the city, community leaders, asking Tel Aviv residents to be prepared for those sirens to go off here as well. Tens of thousands bracing for that possibility. Also, the IDF is calling up select IDF reservists to active duty. It is a limited call-up only. Israel's South was on fire this morning. Rocket alerts are still going off even as we speak. Overnight, Hamas launched 400 rockets. They were deadly. They've killed people in Israel. They've caused many critical injuries. Israel's vaunted Iron Dome defense system intercepted about 100 of those rockets, but most got through. It is the largest number of rockets fired from Gaza ever in a single day. Now here's the numbers right now. They are fluid. They will change. But we know that the rocket barrage this morning from Hamas killed one man in Ashkelon after a rocket made direct impact on an apartment. Two other Israelis are critically hurt. At least 90 other people have injuries as well, ranging from cuts and bruises, wounds from running away, also anxiety attacks and shock. We also want to point out as we speak, 11 Israelis are still in the hospital right now. Survivors from that Ashkelon barrage are speaking out about their early morning of terror. I'm terrified. Me and my, me and my daughter, we cried before. A lot of people cried out on the stairs, going downstairs. And uh, there's a lot of babies here. Everybody uh, was evacuated outside, must stay outside. I, I hope that everything's going to be okay. One of the hardest hit areas was Ashkelon. If you're not familiar with that city, it's a big city, about 150,000 people. It's on the coast, and that is where one person was killed. Many others were injured. That's a look now on the map showing where Ashkelon is in relation to Gaza, about eight miles or so. Uh, let's go live to our guy, Azriel, who is covering the cleanup efforts and the aftermath in that city, who has been speaking with residents this morning. Guy, and get us caught up on some of the, the atmosphere around you as this cleanup continues, the destruction still all around you. Yes, Jeff, it has been a difficult uh, night for the residents here in Ashkelon and also a lot of commotion uh, throughout this morning with uh, um, a series of politicians and army personnel visiting the site. Right now, uh, Israeli opposition leader Tsipi Livni uh, has just arrived here, uh, also speaking to the residents earlier. We had uh, the chairman of the Labour Party, Mr. Avi Gabay, also speaking to the residents, hearing a lot of anger. Those residents here are demanding answers. They uh, want to be protected. They feel like the government and the military are not doing enough to protect them from those barrages of rockets. And just a short while ago, we were able to speak to the spokesperson for the IDF unit. Um, let's take a listen to what he had to say about the IDF of strikes in Gaza in attempting to prevent further attacks. We have been attacking and denying Hamas these capabilities, whether it is their ability to effectively fire rockets. They continue to fire rockets, but their ability really to, uh, to hit is very limited. They continue to fire. We have now a proven system 
of finding and destroying terror tunnels. We did, they they uh, uh, used to have the ability to dig tunnels and to pop up uh, uh, to do so. So I think to sum it up, Hamas is not in a good situation. They're suffering. The results here is because of Hamas is drawing the Gaza Strip into a desperate situation because of their situation. And new rocket sirens going off in the wider Ashkelon region. Guy, you spoke earlier with uh, politicians who were visiting that city, a hard-hit city. You spoke with some of the opposition leaders. I understand, as you mentioned, Sipi Livni, she's around you as well. What are these politicians telling the citizens of Ashkelon? What are they promising? What do they want to do? Jeff, it really depends on who are you speaking to. Uh, very obviously, uh, politicians from the opposition uh, think that they have an easier time here um, while they also choose to attack the government for their inability to do anything uh, with Gaza in the past four years since the last operation. Uh, Hamas, of course, keeps arming itself and the residents suffer uh, those rockets right now. We've also seen a few uh, politicians from the coalition here. Um, Ashkelon uh, is, a, is a hub to many uh, supporters of the Likud party of Netanyahu. So we've seen a lot of back and forth supporters and criticism over what the government is doing. But uh, I think what uh, is really in common to all, the speak to all the people we spoke to is the need for protection. And that is clearly something they're not uh, getting enough. And we have Tsipi Livni right next to us. Let's try to take a listen to what she's saying right now. That's all right, Guy. Keep getting, trying to get closer. I'll talk a little bit as you get closer. But that's Sibby Livni, opposition leader. Our Guy Israel trying to put the microphone to her. And if he could, he'd also translate as well. But she's speaking to Israeli residents who are impacted right now. That's Sibby Livni. Let's try and listen in. All right, she's speaking now about the bomb shelters in the area. That's Guy Israel. You can see the I-23 in his microphone. What should the government be doing today? Before speaking about what the government should do, uh, I believe that the international community should understand what's happening here. Uh, we are in a situation in which Hamas, which is a designated terrorist organization, uh, decided to attack uh, Israeli civilians with no reason at all. I mean, just a few days ago, they got from Qatar, the money that they uh, asked for, demand, uh, and now, uh, without any real reason, they decided to ignite the region again. This is not only against the Israeli civilians, this is the, against the interest of the international community, and I would not uh, compare uh, uh, those saying that both sides should be, you know, should uh, calm down. It's not about both sides. Israel is uh, uh, a state that tries to give uh, security to its own citizens against terrorist organization. This is the situation. So when we are acting, this is in self-defense in order to prevent uh, damage, as you can see here. Uh, for Israeli uh, citizens. And listen, I'm the leader of opposition now, but uh, I must say that when it comes to Israel's security and the need of Israel to defend itself and the right of Israel to defend itself, we all stand together. If you were prime minister right now, what would you uh, ask the army to do? I would do, I would do the following. I believe that this is not uh, only a military uh, option. I believe that we should do both. On one hand, when needed to defend ourselves and uh, to regain deterrence to the state of Israel, but simultaneously, simultaneously we need to act uh, and to reach an understanding with the moderates on the Palestinian side. The meaning is the Palestinian Authority, and uh, with them to work together in order, in the long run, to replace Hamas and to demilitarize Gaza and to have a better and non-terrorist uh, government in Gaza. Uh, this is something for the long run. And now, right now, what we need to do is to regain quiet and deterrence and simultaneously, as I said, to work with the moderates against the extremists, to work with those that are cooperating with Israel on Israel's security against designated terrorist organizations that represent a religious conflict. There is no hope for peace with Hamas.
There was Tsipi Livni, the head of the Israeli opposition here in Ashkelon, uh, trying to speak uh, to the residents uh, to give them uh, some comfort, perhaps, uh, showing some, some support to the policy of the Israeli government, uh, and yet uh, voicing her criticism for Netanyahu's failure, perhaps, uh, to speak to the moderates among the Palestinians in an effort to bring uh, to a diplomatic solution, perhaps, to this situation. Yeah, God, tremendous. This work. I know that you had to hustle in order to get Tsipi Livni. Excellent job. I want to ask you, when you were going to Tsipi Livni, she was in the middle of a conversation with some of those residents who survived the attack. I, I heard the word bomb shelter. They were talking about some kind of bomb shelter. Were you able to understand at all what they were saying in Hebrew before she switched to English? What were they talking about, if you caught it? Uh this really points to two major uh, issues in this particular neighborhood here in Ashkelon. The first is the fact that many of these buildings are very old and have no shelters uh, inside the, these apartments. Residents have 30 seconds to get to shelter, to go down three stories, four stories down and uh, find the next shelter. That is almost impossible to do, particularly in the middle of the night. Another major issue here is the fact that uh, the population living here is the weaker population. We see many new immigrants, both from Ethiopia and from Russia, uh, here. Many of them don't even speak the language. Uh, and residents here that we spoke to said that they really don't even understand what's going on. There are not enough people here from the government, from the municipality, to speak to them, to calm her them down and to give them the instructions into what to do next. All right. Guy Israel, excellent live reporting. Thank you so much for that update. You heard it there first. The leader of the opposition, Sipi Livni, giving her thoughts thoughts on the next step with Hamas and the need for a response as well. Also, speaking of the political reaction and all of the politicians and political leaders speaking with the victims of the rocket attack, going down to hear firsthand from the survivors of the rocket barrages. A short time ago, we also spoke with Gideon Sa'ar, a longtime Likud politician. Uh, some say is in line to be perhaps the leader of the Likud after Netanyahu leaves his life in politics, and certainly a big name in Israel. Here's what Gideon Sa'ar had to say. Ashkelon has been through a very difficult 24 hours, with a large numbers of missiles launched at it. There are not enough shelters. I heard this from the mayor now, at a meeting I had in his office. He presented the problems that we have learned of from this round of fire, and the issue of shelters focusing on the old neighborhoods, and I am convinced that it will be taken care of. Here on a special edition, we're not just speaking with Israeli politicians, although that is certainly important. We're also hearing now from Palestinians. They are reacting as well to the Israeli counter attack. As I'm speaking, I have to pause to point out another rocket alert siren going off. This is for the Israel-Gaza border, a periphery community, a kibbutz there. We should note that these rocket sirens are going off now because just minutes ago, the security cabinet resumed after that perhaps lunch break or decompression session. They took a short recess. The security cabinet now back in session. The rocket sirens again going off. The alerts going off on our phones. Back to the soundbite I'm about to throw to. The Israeli politicians are certainly speaking with victims and survivors of the rocket attack. So are Palestinians. They're reacting as well. They have a lot to say to what happened overnight. Gazans are saying that what the Israeli military did overnight lacks basic humanity in their response. Here's some of that thought. What happened is that the people were sitting in their homes when the Israeli forces dropped warning missiles and missiles from drones. The residents were surprised and they noticed the Israeli forces were targeting the Al Amal Hotel. The Israeli forces dropped missiles with drones, then used F 18s. What about humanity and human rights? Where is the world and the Arab world to see what is happening in Gaza? Half of the residents in this area were unconscious from the smell, smoke, and fire. All the walls and glass collapsed over our heads. This is what happened in the last missile from the F-16 destroyed everything. All right, back now in studio with our Emily Rose, our Middle East correspondent. Emily, is Hamas in some kind of bind here? I mean, this all started with an exposed undercover IDF. This is all of this money that's promised to go into Gaza that has to go through Israel first. They lose the electricity and the diesel trucks. Doesn't Hamas have to really carefully weigh 
how far they want this to go. It's interesting, in this case, Hamas really does have a lot to gain. I also was uh, uh, communicating with a Gaza resident who lives in the Southern Strip, and that was actually where a lot of the incidents took place overnight that you mentioned, and she's absolutely petrified. Uh, the, if you look at the images coming out of the Gaza Strip at this moment, uh, you can see that uh, the, the, the complete destruction sure. that's occurring there. And one, it's not just a worry of Hamas, it's also a worry that Israel has that it will uh, unseat Hamas and whatever replaces it might be even worse. Uh, so uh, really Hamas... We heard that fear actually just minutes ago from an Israeli resident who says we certainly understand as bad as things are we do have to have that lingering fear of we don't know what happens next. That's right and there are other Islamist extremist groups are, uh, in the strip that Hamas has thus far been trying to keep a lid on but uh, many of the rockets that you saw fired yesterday were fired from those uh, Islamists and Hamas has the responsibility of keeping them under wraps because Israel holds Hamas for all violence that comes out Absolutely. of the Gaza Strip. All right, so again, the, the uh, Israeli politicians, they are traveling down to southern Israel. They're speaking with residents, Israeli commanders, the security cabinet. They're meeting right now in Tel Aviv to discuss their next steps. Let's check in with our Lauren Izo, who is live on the Israel-Gaza border, to get the third element of this puzzle. What is the IDF doing today? What kind of airstrikes perhaps are they running today to respond? Uh, Lauren, get us caught up. Well, Jeff, the most recent thing we're hearing from the IDF is that one of their helicopters um, attacked a group of Palestinians that were attempting to infiltrate the fence. Also, before that, we heard there was airstrikes uh, happening in Rafa, which is in the southeast of the Gaza Strip. Uh, and before that, they were reporting that between 150 to 170 Hamas and Islamic Jihad targets uh, were hit inside the Gaza Strip. Um, the IDF uh, has also given new directives for its residents in the south, saying they don't have to remain in shelters constantly like they have been saying before, but they can be out and about sort of around the shelters, not too far so they can run to it if there is a rocket siren. Um, earlier today, an IDF vessel targeted Hamas vessels that they're calling terror vessels. Um, the, the IDF is generally blaming Hamas for this latest escalation, although they are saying that the rockets are coming from Hamas and Islamic Jihad. Now, the IDF has said uh, they are calling up some very few reservists. Uh, they say they're calling... Uh, uh, those uh, soldiers who operate the Iron Dome anti-missile system, uh, which actually stopped more than 100 uh, of those more than 400 missiles that were launched from Gaza. They're also calling up some IDF uh, special forces reservists. So we'll have to wait and see how much more this conflict is going to escalate. All right, a lot of IDF airstrikes. Lauren Izo for us on the Israel-Gaza border, keeping tabs on the latest information. Thank you, Lauren, so much. Welcome back. What happened this morning was historic. Never before in a 24-hour period has that number of rockets been launched from Gaza to Israel. Roughly 400 rockets. Again, this was a deadly attack. Dozens of Israelis wounded, several of them that by last count, 11 still hospitalized right now. Never before had so many rockets been launched. But in recent mom months, Hamas has been launching rockets and mortars. There has been an escalation of rocket attacks, in fact, since August. Here's a look back at recent history. If you're not that familiar with this country, Israel, you may be surprised, really, to learn how close all of these cities are to each other. From the North Gaza Strip to Sterot, a city home to about 30,000 people, a pretty big college town, it's less than one mile away, pretty much always in eyesight. Sterot overnight was hit with dozens of rockets. 
from the North Gaza Strip to Ashkelon, a major coastal city home to about 150,000 people or so. It's just an eight-mile distance. Dozens of rockets landed there, scoring direct hits on homes, apartment buildings. At least one person died. Many more hurt. In Beersheba, a major desert metropolis home to 200,000 people, it's 35 miles. Beersheba also in recent weeks was hit with rockets. And in South Tel Aviv, where our studios are, where I'm sitting now, it's just 40 miles or so from the Gaza border. And a few weeks ago, a Hamas rocket landed off the coast of Tel Aviv in the sea. Now, let's go to our guy, Azriel, reporting live in Ashkelon, as you just saw, just about eight miles from the Gaza border, where a lot of Israeli politicians and leadership are traveling to hear from these survivors firsthand. You've been speaking with these political leaders, Guy. Give us a sense of what they're saying, the discussions they're having with the residents who are affected. Right, Jeff. This site where we're standing uh, here right now, and since the earlier hours of the morning uh, has been a hub for uh, residents visiting from uh, from all over Ashkelon, really uh, looking to see what has uh, happened here, looking at the site of um, this building that suffered this direct impact. You can see the many residents here uh, coming to see the damage, but also demanding answers, demanding uh, help from the government, from the municipality, asking a lot of questions. And uh, many of the people uh, that came here also included the politicians, Tsipi uh, Livni, the opposition leader, was here just minutes ago, and we heard from her what she thinks the government should do. Before speaking about what the government should do, uh, I believe that the international community should understand what's happening here. Uh, we are in a situation in which Hamas, which is a designated terrorist organization, uh, decided to attack uh, Israeli civilians with no reason at all. I mean, just a few days ago, they got from Qatar the money that they uh, asked for, demand, uh, and now, uh, without any real reason, they decided to ignite the region again. This is not only against the Israeli civilians, this is the, against the interest of the international community. That was T.P. Livni, and uh, just an hour before Livni was here, we had a chance to speak to Gidon Saar, uh, a politician that is considered by many as a pos possible uh, contender to be the next prime minister of Israel. Here's what he has to say. Ashkelon has been through a very difficult 24 hours, with the large numbers of missiles launched at it. There are not enough shelters. I heard this from the mayor now at a meeting I had in his office. He presented the problems that we have learned of from this round of fire and the issue of shelters focusing on the old neighborhoods, and I am convinced that it will be taken care of. Have we lost our deterrent capability? We have to strengthen the residents at this moment. This is what needs to be done at this moment. Thank you guys so much. More reaction, of course, coming in as more politicians visit that hard-hit city of Ashkelon. Thank you, guys, for that update. Back in studio, we were in Gaza uh, last night, and we were, we were speaking with homeowners there. We were in their, in their homes, in their backyards. They have like some of the pieces from Hamas rockets. This is a piece, apparently, from a Hamas rocket. You can see it here, about two feet Along, This was intercepted, apparently, by the Iron Dome, and it comes raining down from the sky, hundreds of feet in the air. It comes raining down. down. It's very hard. Clearly, something like this, this is part of a Hamas rocket, can cause a lot of damage, can, can kill you. Even after the Iron Dome interception, the warning is that, from the idea, you have to stay in your shelter for 10 minutes after the, the rocket uh, siren goes off, because pieces like this, shards and fragments, can come down and from hundreds of feet and kill you. But something like this, just a fragment, shows that Hamas isn't messing around with these rockets. It's very big pieces. They're spread out all over Gaza. They're in people's backyards. They're in their, in their front yards, in their in kindergarten uh, rooms. I mean, this is real. This is devastating. And it could be, and it has been, deadly. How important is that, I mean, especially with these, with these sirens, that people take it seriously, with these Iron Dome intercep interceptions, it's not a fail-safe. And you know that very well. I think what we, clearly what we know is that when people listen to the instructions they're given, lives are saved. We saw it in Bersheva a couple of weeks ago when a, a single mother of three grabbed uh, her kids at 3.40 in the morning, rushed them into the sure. safe room. The house was destroyed. The safe room was safe. She survived, and so did her kids. And I think, uh, uh, and this, this is our experience. You have the active 
defensive systems like Iron Dome and other um, aerial defense capabilities, and you have the passive defensive systems, which is what does the individual do? How do you conduct yourselves? Do you lie on the ground when you hear a siren? Do you rush into the safe room? I want to also ask, I mean, we see this here again, this, shot, this, this piece from a, a Hamas rocket. This is a little fragment of it, about two feet long. It's very heavy. It's very, it can cause a lot of damage. You've heard this many times that, well, Hamas, they're basically launching fireworks, and it's not going to cause a lot of damage, that the hype is, is, is very over, is overblown of the, the destructive power of what Hamas is launching. This is, what do you say, I mean, we have it here in studio, I mean, what do you say to that kind of allegation that what Hamas is launching, it's not that destructive compared to what the IDF is doing in the counterattack. So I, I was frequently asked that type of question by, I don't know, BBC and CNN and throughout my military service. They're rudimentary rockets, and I would answer to anybody that says something to belittle these, these weapons of, of terror that they've never been on the receiving end of one of those. If that hit you in the head, you would not get up. And this is just a shard. This is just a, a fragment of something that was exactly. broken up. It's not the detonation, it's not the explosion, it's not... It, that would kill you. Uh, Emily, we're running out of time here, but these new reports, again, that the diplomatic channels are back open, uh, and we have this, we'll keep this, the fragment here, but it shows just the devastation of, of what something like this can do. But there is, at least for now, a glimmer of hope that there could be... A, a, restoration of calm. It, of course, all depends on the security cabinet, but there is hope. We've also seen Hamas uh, issue a statement saying that uh, they are trying to gather other groups to meet with other groups and that they have proven that they have uh, shown Israel what they can do. In other words, saying we've shown what we can do. Each side wanting to make a mark and walk away. Each victory side, and go home. Victory, that's right. They need to prove that they are victorious to their own base. And uh, so they are firmly now, as it seems, waiting to see how the Israelis react after that cabinet meeting. Uh, we're going out for a short break. We have more live coverage here on this special edition of Daily Dose. We have reporters live on the Israel Gaza border tracking the ongoing, reportedly ongoing IDF airstrikes in Gaza. We have reporters at the IDF military headquarters where the security cabinet meeting is now stretching into its fifth hour. A lot at stake depending on the outcome of that. We have live reporting in Ashkelon and other areas that were hard hit from the rocket attack, the deadly rocket attack this morning. Expert analysis here in studio, the kind of coverage you won't get anywhere else. Keep it right here after a short break. More special edition coming up next.